listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. Hello, hello. This is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. Jackie, Jackie on the street. Is that what we're going to call you? Why, can you hear it? Why is there, I mean, how are you supposed to be cool when you're walking down the street in Austin and you're literally has jazz at every restaurant? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's actually a good thing, though. That's like that's a, a good city to be in is Austin. And, and what are you doing in Austin, Miss Jackie? I know. It's an anniversary of sorts. I'm at Work Human. Nice. Very good. Yes. I, I am a slacker and did not attend this year. Um, and so Jackie is representing uh, representing the family of Inclusive AF. Um, so this is the Inclusive AF podcast. Thanks for listening. We are joined by a wonderful guest today and i'm going to turn it over dan to you to introduce yourself and share a little bit about who you are all right well happy to be here my name is dan Har. my pronouns are he and they i am a diverse equity and inclusion professional but an erg strategist i always say that due to the fact that my passion for diverse equity and inclusion really thrived with uh, me getting more involved with employee resource groups so from going into marketing, going into talent acquisition, then leading an ERG, and then have being tapped on the shoulder saying, I think your passion has some purpose. So let's put that into action. And that's where it led me into diverse equity inclusion. And I think my passion with ERGs comes a little too strong at times to the fact that I have a t-shirt that even says ERGs on today. Because <laughs> yeah, that's who I am. But outside of that, I am a proud gunkle of a 10 year old. Gunkle means gay uncle. I live in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, also Lincoln, Nebraska, as I live here with my partner, Joe. And yeah, just ready to take on what's life adventure. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and I do love this shirt. So uh, Jackie, I don't know if you can see it, but we have a a very shiny, shiny ERG sign on his shirt. Uh, it looks very cool. I and was very excited. Yeah. I really want that. I was like, no, dude, I want the shirt. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so dad, tell me first off, where did the passion for ERGs come from? Like how, when did that start and, and why was, why has that been a thing for you? Well, also when I was, uh, first got into actually my first corporate entity. So I got in there and being a gay individual and I don't want to, you know, back in the stone age for me, it feels like many years ago, Coming in, I wasn't sure how I could share myself authentically and be safe. So when I got into my first corporate job, I found out that, okay, we have employee resource groups and there was an LGBT one. And I got more involved and started take, paying it interest. And that kind of interest also sparked from the second week of being there. I was actually, someone pushed me across the hallway and they said, move it, insert the F word. And I was like, okay, we're not supposed to do that in corporate America. Are we supposed to? What's going on here? But from there, I, I got more involved with LGBT ERG. And from that point, they're like, hey, we have a VP position. And I'm like, what's that? And I call, we have positions on our board. And you help, you know, serve the DNI strategy and implement different initiatives and events. I'm like, oh, so like happy hours? And like, well, yeah, kind of. And when I got in there, I started seeing the momentum of really able to align it with our new DNI strategy that's coming into play. So at that time, Angela Cooper, soon to be AKA my boss, came into play as the director of diverse equity and inclusion, started seeing what I was doing with uh, the LGBT ERG and how I had opportunities within talent acquisition and my connections with other company heads of saying, hey, how can we really evolve our ERGs to do more? Because at the end of the day, you're looking at these ERGs and they're already working nine to five and the ERGs work is their passion work. So how can we put that passion into purpose and cultivate an impact to really uplift the people so they can feel like they can be their authentic self? And then from there, you know, Angela tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, I got a job. And I'm like, okay. So from there, I was able to put my project manager hat on and my program manager hat on and actually embed a ERG strategy to look and feel more of like a business sector and say, hey, business units, we're gonna be having quarterly ERG strategy sessions. What do you wanna see from us? How can we add value back to you? But also we wanna see value that you add back into us and really how that unfolded into something that was definitely uplifting to see 
intersectionality between ERGs as well as making sure the ERGs are going beyond just happy hours. Like, yeah, happy hours are great. Trust me, I like a drink. Trust me, I could use one right about now. But I think the meaning of, you know, building up that allyship, uplifting the heritage months into actually action versus putting a post on social media. Social media is great, but what else can your company do to really uplift that day of observation and say, okay, it's, not, it's Diwali day. Cool. The image doesn't really depict or doesn't let your employees really live that out. Or what is pride? Yay, rainbows. I'm gay. I love rainbows. Don't get me wrong. I got sequence blazers galore. However, glitter could, you know, we can calm down the glitter and the Skittles, taste the rainbow, whatever. But how can I actually talk to an entity about my journey of being a proud gay man out in public as well as how can I uplift my trans community and say, these individuals really deserve a voice at the table. How can we do that? And the ERGs is definitely a, st uh, a stepping place that we can make those introductions as well as bringing them to that table and say, hold the seat. Let's talk. I love that so much because I have been known as um, being anti-ERG. But the real thing is I I'm, I'm, don't want to be in a book club, like you're saying. It's like I didn't join. I came to work not to make for my friend group. Like I'm trying to keep those things separate. And so I want it to make sense. And it sounds like you've been able to do that. And so I'd love to hear you talk more about the strategy part. Because I don't think people look at it as a strategy. They look at it as a more of a, an expense and something that you can utilize in the business. So talk, can you talk a little bit more about the framework and the strategy that you, you know, that journey? Because a lot of people are like, what do you mean strategy? Why do we need a strategy? So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So um, back then when I was with that company at that time, we kind of build our format of their DNI strategy back then to three pillars. So workforce, workplace, and marketplace. And I took that and trying to align it with our ERGs and challenge them every time we met quarterly and say, okay, we're then all come together. We're going to be given this opportunity to say, okay, how can we build structure within the upcoming three months? So quarterly phase, similar to a business unit does every time, how can we address it on the coast of workplace, work workforce and marketplace that being workforce how can we up that lift that allyship internally workplace how can we retain that top talent or attract that top talent and marketplace is how do we show out in the community so how can we give back to our community partners how can we do more volunteering how can we make more of a presence of our voices being heard and really aligning that as well as during that quarterly uh, conversations it was a time for actually us to actually challenge one another within the ERGs I was a big thing of, uh, like for instance, if your company is huge and if you have nine ERGs, times that by 12, that's 108. If I got that wrong, I don't have my calculator with me, but I believe it's 108. 108 <laughs> events. Do we have, does your employees have time capacity to actually go to all 108 events? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, because if they're either in the call centers, they're working on projects or depending on what kind of focus area, they don't have time to get away. So during those quarterly meetings, I really challenged each ERG saying, okay, you have three events that you can post, you can host this, this quarter. They're like, why three? I'm like, three is your max. Actually, I don't, ideally, I would like you just to have one or two. And they're like, well, that kind of defeats the purpose. Like, what if we have a month's observation and we really want to go all month out? Great start planning that out six months in advance and really narrowing it down. Like for example, our uh, back then our Asia Pacific heritage ERG was talking about Diwali. Diwali is one day. They took six months to map out a whole entire event during the lunchtime. So everyone come down and eat, but experience hand painting, map drawing, taste different ethnic foods, as well as seeing Diwali dancers. And from that six months of playing that one event, that event is still talked about to this day versus just talking about, oh, we're going to do trivia for Pride. Cool. I already know, you know, the riots happened. I already know about Stonewall. I get it. Trust me. It's like gay 101 for me. But at the same time as I know some people don't have that experience, so we need to have that. But trying to challenge them, how can we do more by, do, by also thinking less? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, okay. 
I love a good acronym, you know, ERGs for instance, <laughs> um, but high live. So high impact, low input. So during those uh, strategy sessions, I was like, what can we deliver that is high impactful, but low in input, being mindful of your time and your resources? Because when you're really also thinking about it, ERGs have a limited budget. We don't, we're not like IT or HR that gets half a million dollars to do whatever they want. Not saying they're not doing everything or, you know, just stupid things. I'm saying, well, I shouldn't say stupid. Things that don't actually deliver ROIs. So if your ERG only has $5,000 for a whole entire 12 month cadence, how can we really pivot that mindset to really think strategically as a business unit? So during those strategy sessions, it kept on me just trying to challenge them and kind of be that devil's advocate, but trying to gear them in a conversation that is gonna be more uplifting to make sure they're delivering things that are memorable and appreciated. And like you said, book clubs are great, but not a lot of people read. I don't read, I watch movies. So like, can, how can we maybe flip that? How can we make uh, my uh, current employer, we didn't do a book club for our ear, our LGBT ERG, we actually did a podcast. So we would either talk about a book, we talk about a podcast, we talk a movie and discuss it versus just kind of saying, oh, in chapter one, we talk about this. And you're like, what? Cool, fantastic. I'm sorry, I fell asleep. What's going on here? But, you know, book clubs can be memorable. It just depends on how you structure and how you align it. But to see if your actually members are getting something out of it too. I love that. I think, you know, one of the things that um, I have always been thinking about when it comes to ERGs is exactly what you're saying that, um, and and we know this from the different communities, and I'm sure you've had this experience yourself where it's, you know, two days before Women's History Month or before, uh, you know, Black History Month, and it's, okay, who can we get for free to come and talk and come and do it? And it's like, no. So I love this whole idea of you know, planning and, and being very intentional in the planning, it sounds like. So tell me, you know, aside from budget, which I think is always a question and, you know, always something that folks are looking for, what does that planning look like? And, you know, and, and this, the, the folks that are listening are, are folks that are in this role or, you know, maybe are in an HR role that, that need help with how do I make this real and, and how do I actually start to think about this differently than I maybe have in the past? I'm happy you asked that because actually that is my pride and joy. So I, you know, Canva, so the online source of creating like infographics and everything, I'm a visual learner. So I took it upon myself to uh, actually connect with a lot of internal partners. So you gotta think about when you're playing a, even a wedding or a birthday, there is different internal partners you have to coordinate with. You got marketing, you got your security, you got your IT, you got the facilities, you have everything. But no one knows how to put it. So I took it on myself and kind of actually looking at if I was playing like a wedding or if I was playing a big event. So I was researching event planning companies and even connecting with people with the knot. That's the wedding people and kind of getting ideas. How do you plan at weddings? How do you do this? Because I was trying to figure out a cadence. So from there and connected with all my internal partners and all of our internal resources online, I created a beautiful, it's purple. I love purple. I'll tell you why I love purple in a little bit, but it's an infograph that I depict and how to break in down time. So like three to six, uh, three to six months, this is where you're gonna be ideating. You're gonna brainstorm. You're gonna figure out what you wanna do as you look towards those upcoming months. One to three months, you're gonna submit in your event uh, event plan to the DNI team or whoever is leading your ERG so they can approve, but also that would be the cadence for you to, okay, let's align our committee with our responsibilities, who's doing what, where are we having it, send out the invites, make send out the save the dates and everything. And then it kind of broke down even more from two weeks out, one week out, the day before, the day of, and also some people don't forget, or I don't include this, but I think is the day after. And the day after really to, you know, regroup as a group and say, okay, what went right? What went wrong? How can we improve? And what can we do better next time? Or is this an event that we want to recreate? But I created a huge infograph and within the infograph had hyperlinks to all the internal partners' emails, as well as a list of our nonprofit organizations that we partner with if we want to reach out and we can bring in a speaker. And also I tell my ERGs, I keep on telling ERGs, 
no matter what. If you bring in a speaker, pay them what they're worth. And if you have a great connection with them, fantastic. But let's see how we can give back to them in some kind of way as well. So I think kind of planning that event, that infograph or my infograph baby that I love so much. I even use it to this day, even in my personal life of how we can really map out and make a plan of event that is actually impactful. Love that. I, I really like the fact because I love making it into a leadership opportunity. Right. They're learning other skills that they can put through. Do you do anything in helping people who participate share that message of how they participated with their departments? Because it sounds like it's a growth opportunity and can be impactful in helping managers as well get people engaged, but also learning additional skills that they can use. Has, is that part of the process at this point? I implemented that when I was with my past employer and uh, I continue, I connect and consult with a lot of ERGs here locally and some national at times too. And there's different ways of, I tell people. So people talk about ERG pay. Well, I was like, okay, well, if you are over senior ERGs, how can you do an annual performance review for your ERG leaders and send it to their managers? You know, your managers have a team of, you know, five to 20 or even more they're not really going to know the extra value that you add to the company. So by sending those performance reviews, they were able to see the value added back to the company. Two, I tell people a great way to engage employees to join an ERG or to join on a leadership board of an ERG. I was like, is networking. You know, if you're in a big entity, you're not going to meet Bob in IT all the time if you're going to be in marketing. So I always tell people, you come to these events, you're going to cross-reference, cross-network with different people in your uh, company, and you'll be able to meet and learn about different positions or different opportunities that are available, as well as when you're in that leadership realm, you're a face to that ERG. You're putting your face out to the company. So those leaders are saying, hey, I see Dan doing amazing things with our LGBT I kind of want to pick a pro his brain for a project we're working on. I'm like, well, you know what? He's doing a lot of things that showcase what we need in this role. Maybe I might want to reach out to it and retain that top talent and send him that job description. And the great thing is I've seen over the past years, ERG leaders are at a percentage of 50% to about 72% wanting to retain, uh, stay with that company because that ERG makes a place like their second home, their second family as well as they were able to get different opportunities within the organization based off of their exposure from the ERGs. So I always try to tell people ERGs are a sales pitch. It helps you not only develop in different skill sets because ERGs have different positions, you know, president, vice president, program coordinators, event chairs, and so on and so forth, but also exposure to those leaders who might not know who you are. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think that is great. And I think the networking piece is kind of the next, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I want to ask what has shifted when you think about this and, you know, talking about planning these events, you know, over a long period of time and how you, you know, what the goals are for those events in this world that we're in of remote work and, you know, folks not being in a centralized location anymore. And, you know, I, I, I myself have uh, multiple locations around the globe that I support how do you think about that and think about kind of that remote or that um, when, when you don't have people all in one place or people coming into a specific office? Well, I challenge the companies to think about it when they're looking at events is what does their audience look like? So if you are a global company, maybe see if you can schedule two events that are at the times that over kind of over shift different times. Like the current company I'm working for right now, we are a global company. And sometimes we have to schedule for events at 8 a.m. It's not great in the Midwest because you're just waking up, you haven't had your coffee, but we wanna make sure our Asia office can participate. And yes, it's very late for them, but we're trying to find out what works with what. And mm -hmm. if it's based off our, you know, if a speaker is coming in, hey, can't make 8 a.m. or they can't make those certain times, we try to best record those events so they can rewatch, as well as trying to see if how we can reduplicate the event in a way that is meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. So I think it just depends on from that ERG scope of what is their overall end goal when creating that event and how can we deliver it on, based on their members. And also it depends on the event if it's just that ERG specific 
or is that ERG really wanting to captivate the audience of the whole entire enterprise? If so, that's going to be, you know, boiling the whole entire ocean. So how can we, you know, scale back but still make impact? So I think there's different ways of how you can approach it. It just depends mm -hmm. on what your overall goal is and how you can stream, work with what you have. Because some companies, you know, they might just have Zoom, but others might have Teams. So they have those affiliates like on Microsoft, they have Teams as well as they have SharePoint and they have uh, Yammer. There we go. I, yes. I knew it was a yes. word. Yammer, it's like social media and everything, but how can we make those events or those uh resources or development opportunities accessible to them if they're not going to be there in real time. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you think about, you know, the the role that you have and it sounds like you're in a, in a company and have been, you know, very fortunate to have leaders that are supportive of this work. Um what about folks who you know, you know, in this world we're in right now, you know, that where DEI programs are being dismantled and, you know, laws are being passed about funding for any type of DEI universities, all of these different, uh, I don't even know how to say, but, you know, just the very unfortunate and like just wackadoo way that things are being handled in regards to DEI. What about those folks that don't have the support of their leadership team or don't have the support of their leader um, to actually drive some of this work? Great question. Difficult question, because <laughs> um, well, the, in, the interesting thing is uh, I'm on the way out of my current company as well, because, uh, you know, especially with these times, business business comes first and foremost, and some of their decisions is best for the business. And I respect that. A lot right. of companies have empathy for those DNI leaders is saying, you know what, we just don't can't make the business sense to it, but we're going to continue moving forward with the ERGs, which is great. I love how they're going to continue investing in those, but it kind of stinks for those people in my position of being like, so I'm out. What does that mean for me? But I think it comes down to just really, you know, being okay with it. So it's relatively fresh for me and relatively fresh for a lot of individuals, but I think it also comes to a point of, giving us still hope because DNI oh. is not going is not going anywhere. It yeah. might change or might be repivoted to culture work or belonging work. But if you look around us, we have diverse talent everywhere we look. And if companies don't realize that, they're going to miss out and not be able to, you know, have business reasons to keep other people around because they're not really seeing that value there. Um, I'm in a biracial relationship. So my partner is black. So I know when he goes to his company, he doesn't see leadership that represents him. He's coming home. He's like, this is B, this is B. I'm going to say B. I'm not going to continue with saying that, but yeah, yeah. this is messed <laughs> up where he's not be able to, he can't see where he's going to be at and within a year or feels like he can move forward. And he talks to me about it. And I was like, Hey, I get it. I'm a white male in a diverse equity inclusion role where majority is usually women or white or people of or women of color or men of color mm -hmm. and being white and the only thing I got going for me is gay as some people say and it's hard for even me to have a seat at the table I think it's just telling those companies let's be real we're not going anywhere diverse equity inclusion is still strong and needs to be uplifted in different avenues so I would want to challenge those companies to relook and repivot their approach and see how they can best align their resources to make sure people like in my position, especially their employee resource groups, to continue to thrive. Because if you don't, some of those employees are going to start seeing that they may not feel like they have a place and want to leave as soon as possible. Yeah, I love the points you're making because, you know, I think that is something that a lot of business leaders don't think about is, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, in within the ERGs, people find that safe team or that group of folks that they, you know, that they really develop strong bonds with, which helps with retention. You, you know, have things that actually do support business goals and do support some of the bigger picture items that a business is trying to drive. And the fact that, you know, you're tying those pieces together of, hey, this isn't something that's going away. This isn't a, a, a hot topic of today that tomorrow won't be a thing. This is something that's real and that will be impactful to your bottom line ongoing. And 
when you do dismantle some of these programs, the rest of the employees see that. And it is a very definite signal of, are you safe here? Is there a place for you here for anyone in a marginalized group? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I appreciate that the folks doing this work, it, you know, it's, I think, always been hard to do this work. There's an additional layer here that you're also fighting a political battle that, yes, there's always been politics involved in so many of these stories and, you know, for marginalized groups. But the idea that now you're even fighting the business case that we've been able to make and and been able to speak about and, you know, it it just is very frustrating. And and so it is one of those things that uh, it's always good to keep that hope and to keep the what can we do? And like you said, what can we what can we fix? And what are the things we just have to go? This is just the way it is. And I'm going to find a place that is right for me. So. Uh, I appreciate your sentiments there because I think they're so important for for folks to hear, especially right now when there are so many DEI professionals that are amazing and doing great work that are getting that different message from their companies and from their leadership and executives of, oh, it's not really that important, actually. We need to worry about the bottom line. And you're like, do you not see that this is all tied together? Uh, just, you know, just a, just a thought, folks. But um, so tell me a little bit about your approach when you're going into a company that doesn't have any ERGs and, and do you have a specific, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, that normally when I'm working with a company, we talk a lot about women first and, and, and the reason why is because that's usually a little bit more approachable for folks, but what are the things that you're thinking of when you're going into a company that maybe doesn't have resource groups currently? Yeah, I, when I'm going into a company that doesn't have employee resource groups and or if they're asking, hey, we want to start one. I'm like, okay, great, fantastic. I love the excitement. I love the passion. But let me back up real quick. I usually ask, how many employees do you have? Do you have a DNI strategy? Do you have or do you have your values tied within your DNI? Like my current company, they have inclusion as one of their values. And I love seeing that because that speaks volumes and it really ties in with their ARGs bringing that message. But mm-hmm. going into a company, asking them, okay, the NI strategy, how big is your company? And they're like, why are you asking this? I'm like, well, you need to align, you need to align that ERG to something as well as you need to have enough people to really, you know, make something happen out of it. If you only have 10 employees or 100 employees, you're looking at, you can't really have nine ERGs because that's state sustainable. So how can we lo- really leverage it? So I kind of backtrack of saying, let's create a strategy if you don't have a DNI strategy. Now, if you do have a DNI strategy, great. You're already 10 feet ahead of everyone else. Let's utilize that and really magnify that. And then I go into asking them, okay, can we get your people's uh, analytic, your people analytics? And they're like, why? Again, you need to have enough people as well as you need to have the right people to sustain those e- those groups. Like I said, everyone loves rainbows. They might want an LGBT uh, ERG, but if you have no way of tracking that, of who identifies as what, because that's still a gray area when people are reporting out when their analytics, mm-hmm. it kind of comes into that territory. Okay. Are you going to out people who are not ready to out just because you want to have a rainbow pride E or G? Mm-hmm. No, we're not going to be doing that. So how can we get your analytics? How can we see how many people you have, your demographics of each, and then let's send out a survey. I know we all love surveys. We all have fatigue. But if the ERGs is something that you really want to instill and your employees want it, that survey is going to be really monumental on how you can establish your first ERG, your second ERG, and so on and so forth, and how you can really build that up. And if your com- company is relatively small, I challenge them, okay, maybe let's not start with an ERG. What about if we do a DNI council or a committee and really start you know, uplifting allyship, intersectionality, and get people's awareness of diverse equity and inclusion. So when they're ready f- to start ERGs, that committee has already set a solid foundation of people bought in, and ready to do more mm-hmm. and take action. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's another piece where when you have a global team or have a, a team that is dispersed across different locations, having a women's ERG in each location can be very difficult or having, you know, a 
whatever ERG in each location, it, you know, it doesn't really work. So the idea of an inclusion council committee group, whatever you want to call it, I think is a great idea as well. Um, so when we think about, um, I'm sorry, my Slack is talking to me. I, I apologize for that. It's a lot, lots going on for some reason, right at this minute. Um, when you think about, um, kind of what's next and what you see in the future, what are some things that are on your mind? What are some things that are on your mind from a kind of a local to your state, maybe national, and then also from a, a global perspective? As of right now, where we currently stand, so I live in a red state. That says a lot. <laughs> but from looking holistically outside, I think uh, the companies who are invest who have state invested within diverse equity inclusion are going to continue and also maybe increase their um, investments. The other companies who might be a little standoffish, they're going to hit some rocky areas. They're mm -hmm. not, it's going to be hard to bounce back right away. And I would say there was a quote or someone, uh, it was a famous actress. I forgot their name. I can see the gif or the video, but they're like, if you're going through a rough time, don't, uh, they say feed into it, push through it and experience it because you're going to be learning a lot. So I want to challenge those companies who might be thinking about or dismantling or reconfiguring is like, just push through, but still have that passion and purpose and go keep moving forward, which I tell people. And that's why I said earlier, my favorite color is purple. Purple is an acronym to me. And I always tell this to companies the per is the purpose and the pull is the people. So through diverse equity inclusion, how can we put the purpose back into the people? Well, that's through diverse equity inclusion. So we're putting that purpose into passion and action. Awesome. When when you're working with companies and you know, when you're thinking about, I mean, I think we are all holding our breath a little bit with, you know, the the political arena of what's going on right now. And how do you give people hope? So, you know, you're exactly what you're saying with your, your uh, purple uh, analogy. I love that. Um, how are you giving people hope in this time where it is like, how are we going to keep doing this or what are we going to do or, or will we be able to keep doing this um, depending on what, what happens here in, in the, the next coming months? I, so from a, from a bigger product perspective, if you have a lot of buy-in, I kind of challenge companies or ERGs to say, how can we maybe take what's happening outside of our, our work and bring it in to have better understanding? So what is the current climate within DNI and the government or anything? And have a better understanding of what that looks like holistically. So I challenge that conversation. Or if that company or if that ERG is like, okay, we're just trying water over here. We're just trying to, you know, make ends meet, so to speak, and still be impactful. I'm like, okay, well, if you're fearful, how can we gauge, how can we pull this in and maybe uh, work with some business units so people will have that additional buying? Okay, no, these are good for us. So partner up with talent acquisition for recruiting efforts, partner up with uh, marketing, how you can expand into making your products have bilingual capabilities, like really can look at your impact as an ERG in a way that is back to the business during this time. So that company knows that, hey, these individuals, they're actually adding value back into the business so we can keep them around versus trying to rock the boat with a rocky, uh, kind of a scary conversation as some companies might be a little, they might say, okay, let's pump the brakes if we're having a political conversation here. We don't need to bring that here. And I understand that, but some people, you know, might want to have that conversation that is eye opening. So I actually understand, okay, what is currently going on? Like, I actually had a conversation with someone the other day. They're like, what do you mean? He's running again. And I'm like, yeah, do you not watch the news? What's going on? And they're like, um, no, I don't. I don't know what's going on anymore. And I was like, well, let's just say, hopefully you're voting and hopefully you take this time to educate yourself. And like, or even some people said, I never vote and I'm not going to vote. I'm like, how can we have a conversation about that? Let's dive into that. But I know that going into the political climate and mixing it with work, that's kind of a rocky issue entirely with a lot of companies. So I would just kind of scope out or tread some water lightly during this time and, but still keep pushing forward as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's the piece that, you know, folks are trying to hold on to, you know, how do we make this okay? How do we make this better? And 
And sometimes the best answer is, you know, just hold tight or just, as you said, tr keep treading water and until we, you know, figure out what is going to be the lay of the land, all of these things. So I, I, I love that. I, um, I think it's really critical for folks to hear what other people are doing and, you know, how to think about some of the stuff. You talked about um, kind of data and data analytics earlier. And, you know, I want to, I want to talk about you know, the, the example you gave of, you know, who is in the LGBT community or identifies as LGBTQ. And I, I want to ask the question, uh, I, I, I know the answer, but I want to ask the question for the listeners of how do you ensure safety for, and you know, I'm, I'll, you know, pick on the LGBTQ community, um, or I shouldn't say pick on, select that group. Uh, but how do you make sure that you aren't outing someone in the trans community or in the LGBTQ community that maybe isn't out of the closet in these situations? Yeah, definitely rocky. Because I, I even tell, uh, being gay and everything, I'm a different gay person than my partner is. So I'm going to be okay if someone comes up to me and is like, hey, I know you're gay, let's talk. And I'll be like, okay. But some people will be like, um, I'm not that gay and I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, what do you mean you're not that gay? What are we talking about? We're all different. We all have different. Is that kind of like I'm not? I'm not really pregnant. Is that? Yeah. Is that <laughs> yeah. It's like what do you what? No, uh -huh. no, we're good. We're fine. Um, but with the analytics part, like it depends on what you're pulling into it, and also your communication of okay, why are you pulling that data? So you can tell your comp you can tell your associates, okay, we're pulling this data, and this is how it may be used. And not saying we're then be reaching out to these people directly, but to get like a narrow scope of how many people identify with in that realm, that's one way. Two, if you're trying to reach out to people and say, hey, like if your LGBT group wants more gay people in it or lesbians or trans or bisexuals, or, you know, I say the alphabet mafia, cause you know, we keep on growing and we keep yes. on letters or even numbers. <laughs> um, but it just, I tell people like, you know what, let's not try to gravitate. Let's try to, maybe shift that mindset of the LGBT ERG and say, okay, how are we projecting allyship? And how can we say, okay, this ERG is creating a safe haven and try to create a safe place for those individuals to come to us versus trying to, hey, we got to find a gay people. Like I found, I watched a movie a couple of weeks ago and they're like, it was, uh, I think your gay best friend. It was a, one of those silly comedy movies that you see on TV. And I was like, I yeah. just need to watch. And they're like, I need a gay best friend. I'm like, okay, well, your LGBT does need to have a, it would be nice to have you have people that identify, but it's also nice to have a, a ERG that uplifts allyship. So those people can come to to that ERG and say, this is a safe haven for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, exactly what you're saying is so true is that, you know, we have to protect folks and we can't, shared that data and using it in the aggregate is always the, you know, the best way to go because invite everyone to the table and those who choose to come and join could be allies, could be part of the community and, you know, having everyone there is great. Um, on the other side of that, how do you determine what events or what activities or um, whatever they might, you know, the, the ERGs might be planning when it's, for that group specifically and when it's okay to invite allies into the conversation how do you think about that i think it comes down to when you're playing like the overall goal but i kind of look at it from a different perspective of saying okay let's look at the month calendar month what obser observations or heritage months are coming up that you want to uplift or do you want to change the narrative and like i've had emerging leaders or young professional ERGs. They don't really have a designated month. So they're like, where do we fit? This doesn't include us. Mm -hmm. So they went from a development standpoint. Okay. How can we gravitate and really uplift people's development or uplift different key areas within the business sector that people don't know about? Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity to just, and during those quarterly sessions, or when I invite other ERGs to the table and kind of collectively brainstorm their upcoming ideas, that's where I, that's a great time for those ERGs to say, hey, we're doing, we're thinking about doing an event in the next month. And that kind of aligns with what your goal is. How can we connect and making, not making them, but just kind of making that opportunity come apparent to them saying, oh, this is an idea. Let's go for this. Like, for instance, women hit, Women's History Month is in March. Trans Day of Visibility, it's March 31st. Mm -hmm. So how maybe the ERG, 
LGBT and the women's group can collaborate on that day, uplifting that special day. Similar to uh, like Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month is September through October. So it's a different time period, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of cadence of what's happening during then how we can uplift that. And Diversity Month, whether you look at it from October and April time period, it's two mm -hmm. different months, you can uplift that too. So I think it comes down to the goal, but also just having that collaboration and that communication with those ERGs can help break down those barriers of like, how can we collaborate or what can we uplift or, hey, I love your message that you want to deliver at that event. We're going to, you know, pause on what we're thinking is a good idea right now, but how can we uplift yours? So maybe reaching out to our membership and say, hey, check out what the women's group is doing next month How mm -hmm. and being great allies for them. So I think it just depends on just making sure everyone is well aware and also eliminate that overlap. Because like yeah. I said, you don't want to have too many events going on as well as you don't have, you don't want to have too many events happen on the same day. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. I've done that. My feet kill from running one side of the building to the other side of the building yes. trying to coordinate for both of them. Of course. Of course. So, um, the, the other piece I think, you know, just to, to frame up is, you know, when you think about those different days, those different activities, those different pieces, um, is the, you, know, you talked about this earlier and I want you to talk a little bit more about it. Is the event the objective or what are the objectives that folks are setting throughout the year or for that day? Great question. I think it's kind of twofold. So when we're doing that strategy session, I tell people we talk about and when I challenge other companies to look at, I was like, what do you want your, comp your employees to take away from that event? So... Yes, I've been in HR in the past, so I'm one of those HR people that, okay, what's our takeaway here? What are we doing? Yeah. What's going yeah. on? Or do we just go eat food and leave? You don't really get anything out of that. So I challenge the ERGs to be, okay, what do you want people walking away with? As well as what do you really want to encompass within this panel event? Do you want to uplift that women have important places at senior leadership level? Great. How are we going to showcase that? Or are you just bringing them to showcase for women who all make half a million dollars each and who are running the business and just speaking like they, and just talking. Yeah. No. So how can we shift that mindset and shift the panel questions to get more key takeaways so they can be inspired? So kind of really just kind of leveling up for them of what are we wanting to get out of, as well as telling people, how can we equip the employees afterwards to give us their feedback? A lot of people don't really realize that's why after those events, I say what we're doing afterwards, because if you don't learn what you just did, you're going to keep on redoing it and thinking it was great when everyone is like, oh, great. Now another book club. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that's such a critical piece is getting that feedback from the folks in the ERG, getting feedback from folks who attend as allies, all of that. So yeah, I, the day after, I love that you said earlier and, you know, reiterating that now, because it is such I, I think all of us have attended those events where you're like, that was neat. Okay, bye. And, you know, and you move on with your life and there isn't really, but then we've also been to those that have been very impactful and very much a, wow, here are the 20 takeaways I took from that conversation, that panel, that whatever, or even a book, just to be clear, I am a reader. Um, <laughs> um, so I, you know, from a key takeaways of this conversation, you know, I, I've loved everything that you've shared, but what is one thing you want to make sure our listeners heard from you or a key takeaway that they can, you know, go implement tomorrow? I leave me with the hardest question. Dang. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to challenge those individuals who look at employee resource group with maybe a questioning or curious mindset and challenge them to go to an event or challenge them to maybe even start an ERG or see how they can equip that into it. And really, really doing the research because when you look at the powerful ways of an ERG can add back, not only to your company, but you as a person, you will see where it leads you. Like for me, I invested my time into an LGBT ERG and it found my passion within diverse equity inclusion. I've seen people come in from a standpoint of, I'm just, in, I'm just doing a call center. I'm just a call center person doing this and this, but going, joining ERG, they thrived in that. And now they are actually action wary, 
Trust me, if you're not knowing what an actuary is, that's a lot of math, a lot of data, but you get paid a lot of money. <laughs> but not embracing those ERGs and the power of what they can be, you might just be still stuck in the dark or the stone ages and be like, yeah, I don't feel like going to a happy hour. ERGs are more than a happy hour, period. Awesome. Love it. Um, you know, and I think that's the the piece, the networking and the, you know, ability to actually get to know folks that you, you said this earlier, and I think this is my takeaway or, or giveaway, whatever you want to say, the people that you're able, you know, we talk about exposure, we talk about mentorship, we talk about um, sponsorship, the people that you meet within these groups, A, you know, they're like-minded in that they are passionate about these topics you can find kind of your your place within an organization and your your reason for coming in every day or showing up every day, um, and being able sorry and being able to translate that into a profession versus a job or a career versus a job is is so fantastic. So I, I love it. So Dan, how can folks get a hold of you if they would like to connect? If they would like to talk with you? Yeah. Well, I am. I use LinkedIn way more than anyone, so my friends think I'm weird, but you can find me on LinkedIn. It is Dan Har, H-A-R-R, so Har, not hair, so not a bunny rabbit, and Dan, <laughs> D-A-N, and I'm always happy to connect and talk more about ERGs and see how we can help each other out. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, Jackie I, uh, had to drop. I, it sounds like she's got some issues as she's at a conference right now with with wi-fi so um we will uh rejoin her uh at another episode but thank you for joining us um this is the inclusive af podcast and this is katie van horn